Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Life to Pitch TV. I'm Mark Murphy and that was our capacity crowd. Well done, everybody. Well done. Fantastic. Uh, we've got lots in store for you tonight, but a special thank you to those who helped make the programme possible. Uh, DPS Tech, our main sponsor of Life to Pitch TV. Also, a big thanks to All About Hearing, marketing company Ginger Pickle, Forward Floors, Come Hither Design, The Hudson Group, Sound 4 Pro Audio, Venue 16, Fred Olsen Logistics, John Keeble Cars in Bramford, The Dove in Ipswich and Ashford Wright. And the sofa is sponsored by DPS Tech. Let me introduce you to the team, Terry Butcher, Yay! Russell Osman, Yay! and from TWTD.co.uk, it's Phil Ham. And on technicals tonight, it's Richard and Dan, I think, making his debut on technicals tonight. So well done. <laughs> we need a special guest. Now, this coming weekend, it's a massive game for the Ipswich Towns women's team. So let's bring in their manager, our special guest on Life's a Pitch TV this week. It's Joe Sheehan, everybody. <laughs> Great to see you, Joe. I know you've been itching to come on the show, and, and I think Terry's got a special gift for you um, to, to start off the proceedings tonight. Yeah, on, when we did the radio show, we um, you always uh, you put forward a, a statement that you like digestive biscuits, chocolate digestive biscuits. So I got a packet then, and now you're on the show, I've got you another packet. So I want to say, how many packets of these do you have a week? Since I've spent less time with you, uh, not that many. All right, all right. But... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I do love a chocolate digestive, as you know so well. So, uh, no, thank you very much. I'll, uh, I'll enjoy them this week. Will You're you? our first guest who's had a rider, actually, who's had a special gift like that, isn't it? I think in the whole season that we've had. <laughs> yes, that's so. right. That's right. But you're putting the pounds on, I can see, for eating yeah. those chocolates. No, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, no, I'd... Uh... I do enjoy these, as you can see. So, uh, yeah. yeah, thank you very much indeed. Good, no, good. Brilliant. Well, look, it's great to have you on the show. Really special to have you on the show. Um, and we'll talk lots and lots and lots about um, what's coming up this weekend. But just a quick feeling. Can you sum up how, how the team, the squad are feeling ahead of playing on the Hallow Turf at Portman Road this week? Yeah, hugely excited. Um, we trained today. I've, I've come straight here from training. And uh, it was quite interesting seeing the end of the session it was probably the most passive we've ever been. Um, which I quite enjoyed actually because they're at a stage now where um, yeah, everyone wants to be a part of the game and uh, nothing reckless, nothing silly because they are a really competitive bunch and we had to uh, rein a few in on Tuesday. So um, yeah, become quite passive tonight. Everyone's excited for the game. Joe, and, was uh, the training session on Portman Road? No, it wasn't. No, no it, was at the, it was at Playford Road. Are you um, going to get a chance to play on on there, have a training session before No, the game? no, we'll, we'll turn up straight there Saturday, mm -hmm. ready to well. play, yeah. So what, what's the program for Saturday? Are you going to have a pre-match meal somewhere, or then get the bus yeah, in? Yeah, so the, the club were were really keen for us to you know replicate the same format as the men, which I think was a really nice touch. So we will travel to the stadium first. Um, we'll get a coach at the training ground. We'll be fed, um, and then a coach back for uh, a welcome arrival and uh, ready to get going. Now, uh, when do you, when do you name the team? We will name it in the briefing at the training ground on Saturday. Um, I know others, and, and I'm sure there are other, lots of other teams that would, would, would give their selection the day before, but we, we would always give our team on the day. So I don't think we will change that for this occasion. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll probably name the team. Uh, we we're in again tomorrow. So, you know, it's like some like to sort of play a guessing game when they see the shape tomorrow. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, we'll name the team Saturday morning um, after our pre-match meal and then uh, head to the stadium. And I know the team uh, are, are really excited about this. And, and the club, as you just touched on, uh, I'm involved on a match day. And I know that all of the match day team that are there for when the men play are there on Saturday. So they are replicating, uh, you know, a men's match day for you guys. So they are really pulling out all the stops. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's 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 huge for us, I think, to, to have that. And, you know, there are, there are other examples of... Um, teams that have opened the odd stand or the odd tier and I think for the club to, to open the whole lot um, It's very it's, respectful isn't it? It is yeah and um, I think that the number of the ticket sales have, have probably showed that that was quite a wise idea yeah. so far so yeah it's um, 
it's going to be a huge honour for us all and, and one we're, we're really excited to look forward to. Well, it's going to be a fantastic experience for everybody concerned. And, and as I said, we've got a lot to talk about tonight. So we'll, we'll come back and talk about that some more. But we do have a game to talk about. Um, what happened last weekend? My goodness, so many goals at Portman Road. Let's take a look at the season so far. Sponsored by the Dove in Ipswich. <laughs> Russ, what did you make of that? Six goals on Saturday. Well, I think the the women's team might get more than that against Chatham when they play. <laughs> so, uh, I thought it was a it was a terrific performance considering because some of those games can be a bit tricky. You know, the side bottom of the table. Some of the players looked short of confidence uh, on the Sheffield Wednesday side, but you never. Sometimes that makes them hard to read and hard to anticipate. And they didn't do things that you'd expect them to do. And sometimes you can come a copper against them. And I thought when we started the second half with 3-0 up and we missed a couple of chances, I started to think if we don't get five, six or seven here, we will walk off the pitch feeling a little bit embarrassed about the second half because... Sheffield Wednesday looked even worse in the second half than they did in the first. And sometimes you think, is that because we're that good? Or is it because they're having a bad day as well as not being very good? You know, and uh, I just think on the day we were very good. What did you make of it, Terry? Oh, you watched the highlights because you were up in Scotland, weren't you? Yeah, I was watching a very poor game in Scotland and I uh, wish I'd been at Portman Road, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, where were you? I was at Inverness against Air United in the championship. Mm. And the crowd was? Um, well, the crowd was about 1,400. Mm. That's, so, the, that's um, the butcher Burley derby, isn't it? Uh, Inverness, Caledonia, yeah, Air United. Yeah, 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 but, wow. Um, I mean, even I could have played in that game, <laughs> I tell you now. When I'm 65, so, yeah, it was Let flipping. it go, mate. I know, Let it I know. go. It was just a bad day, you I know. I know, it's just disappointing. <laughs> disappointing. That'll anyway, moving you. on. It's a long uh, way to see go. the highlights. What but did the you make of the but, goals? The, but the food was good in the boardroom, I must say. Oh. It was really nice, yeah. But um, And i tell you who, else, who came up. Uh, Jamie Carragher came up because his boy was playing for... For uh, Cali. That must have excited you even more then. Well, he didn't last particularly very long, his son, because he was taken off after about an hour. So I haven't been booked in the first half. So, yeah. There you go. Yeah, but no, it was it was good. I mean, Jamie came up and obviously people had more pictures with him than with me. So that was quite nice. Um, and in the end of the day, it was a nice day out. And um, that's about all I could say. But having said that, it's a, the best view from a boardroom ever on the Mori Firth. And apparently... There was um, a couple of uh, whales seen uh, that week. I wish I'd stayed in the boardroom and watched the whales and not the game. <laughs> but, uh, but apart from that, it was good. But I, I missed I missed uh, a great game. I saw the highlights, saw the goals. Yeah. And I, you know, I just I mean, you talk about how was Sheffield Wednesday bad or whips is good, and I was sort of think, well, Sheffield Wednesday's defending was chronic. It was awful. So, yeah. you know, but you've got to you can only beat the team that's in front of you. And you know, I think Sam Morsey promised a reaction. And that's what football is is all about—a reaction. So, um, you certainly got the reaction that the, you know they, they they needed, and it sets everything up as well. Well, everything's still to play for. What did you make of it, Phil? I think well, some of us were talking in the press room beforehand. As soon as we saw how Sheffield Wednesday were going to line up, because some of their sort of journalists were saying that's pretty much the most attacking team that they could have put out. And we thought, hello, we're in a bit of a chance of winning comfortably here, because. I think when teams come and try and play us at football, unless they're the really top teams like Leeds or Leicester or whatever, we tend to take them apart, don't we, these days? And um, it's it's when teams try and stop us the way that Bristol City tried to, um, that's when they kind of make life hard for us. Um, so kind of, you know, some of us are sort of wetting our... Uh, you know, it, it's kind of whetted the appetite to see what sort of team that they'd put out. I think they perhaps had a bit of overconfidence because they've had one or two decent results lately. Um, and I think they felt that they were good enough to, to go toe-to-toe with. But I think uh, it showed that they were very much not. But we were, yeah, we were terrific. We played really, really well. Well, we uh, saw Neil Thompson at the Players' Reunion we did. On, on Friday night. And, and Tomo was saying that, you know, a bright young manager that had some decent results recently. He was quietly confident. I, I did see him on the pitch before the game and said, have a good afternoon, but not too good. <laughs> and he said, well, I'll say the same back to you. I didn't see him at the end. Did you? So. I saw yeah. him at half time <laughs> and he looked up at the, where we were sitting and he just shook his head. Yeah. Uh, you, you, and he just, yeah. You were there, Joe, as well, weren't you? Because I spoke to you pitch side. What did you make of that? 
Yeah, it was a great performance. And I'd watched Sheffield Wednesday play Leeds, I think, the week before on Sky. And I thought, I think as mentioned here, you know, had the uh, potential to be a really tricky opposition and it had some positive results. And I think the morning of the game, I remember watching Sky Sports News ticker and it sort of showed the game preview and had Sheffield Wednesday and it had strung a, a few names that were going to be doubtful or out. I thought, oh, that was interesting that they you know, had maybe a few players out. But yeah, good performance. And I, I think our, our first goal probably epitomises everything we enjoy about watching our team because probably as a complete goal you're going to get. I think, on a football pitch. And, uh, yeah, it started at what was a, a really good day. Russ, how good is Amari Hutchinson? Oh, blimey. You put me on the spot there, Mark. Um, but how could good could he be? I think that's... I think any young player with his ability um, has a world in his hands, really. But it's down to him. If he can keep his feet on the ground... I know when he scores a, a <laughs> goal, his, his feet are up there. You know. yeah, yeah. Um, if he keeps himself solid and uh, sensible, then he's got a terrific future in front of him. He can he can go both ways. Obviously, his left foot's his better one, but he's a great goal. Uh, you know that he scored on Saturday. His, his first one, second one was a very clean finish as well. Um, and it, I'm not quite sure that we've seen the best of him yet by a long way I think once he settles into playing 90 minutes week in week out I think we're going to see a stronger performance from him than what we're seeing at the moment I think now and again he still makes the wrong decision for me now and again around the 18 yard box but he's making better decisions more often now one of the things well one of the things that um, Kieran McKenna talked about with him when he first came to the club, was um, adding the defensive side to the game. Because um, I think he's, he's always been a player who's been good on the ball. And I think Kieran wanted him to work a lot on his work off the ball. Do you think he's, he's, he's come a long way on that front? Um, I like to see defenders defend and attackers attack. So I look at him from the point of view of what he does when he gets the ball going forward. You know, I'm not a great observer of what attackers do when you want them to defend. But if Kieran says he needs to work on it, then he works on it, you know. Uh, likewise, I want to expect Wolfie to be going up there and scoring a couple of goals week in, week out. Um, but I, I'm sure he's young enough. And like I say, that's the sort of thing that he's got to um, um, make the most of. If he's getting advice like that from, from Kieran McKenna and he's putting that into his game, that'll make him a better all-rounded player then. And a question, uh, speaking after the game, about, um, he said he'd been called up by England at various levels and Jamaica, but he'd kind of put all that out of his mind at the moment because he wanted to concentrate on football with town, his domestic football, first loan. Um, do you think he's got a chance of playing for England at, well, it's ultimately? Well, it's a bit of a, bit of a sort of um, dilemma to play for Jamaica or play for England, really, isn't it? Come on now, you're going to play for England. Well, yeah, that's what he wants yes. to do. You know, I think he's hedging his yeah. bets at the moment to see how he, yeah, how he yeah. ended up. But do you, think yeah. he's, do you think he's got a real chance of playing for England? Well, I don't think at the moment. Not, not, no, not at the moment, but no, in two or three years' time. Eventually, but, eventually but, possibly, yeah. What's there might be there for the next 10 years. Hmm. Um, I did hear his, uh, his Man of the Match um, award speech after the game, you know, when I think, uh, I'm not sure if it was Simon Milton or Matty Holland asked him about the future, does he see his future at uh, Ipswich Town Football Club? And his comment was, um, uh, he'll make the, the best decision for himself. Hmm. I mean, I don't see him coming to Ipswich on a permanent basis, even if we're promoted. I think that there'll be, I mean, he's obviously got another year in his Chelsea contract, and I think there'll be bigger clubs than Ipswich interested well, in him, won't I there? mean, his value certainly improved, you know, gone up, uh, increased yeah. since he's come here, and it'll go up even more, but the potential... You know, at the end of the day, he's still learning. He's still learning the game, and he's still learning about playing for Ipswich and playing at a high level, sort of thing. And then, you know, he's he, and he's he's taking it on board very quickly, isn't he? Very relaxed, and you know, he, okay, things don't quite come off, but you know, I'm sure with Lionel Messi, things didn't come off straight away. Yeah. And he, you know, he had to work at his game, but he's got the potential. And he's a match winner as well. I mean, yeah. like with no Connor Chaplin, and all of a sudden he comes on, and yeah. you know, he does he does he does really well. So, wow. I hope he keeps getting his somersault and reverse twist with double <laughs> pike, right? Because if that you, goes wrong one day... He's I couldn't <laughs> imagine me doing it and I couldn't imagine you doing it. 
I can imagine Kevin Beatty doing that. Yeah, honest. he probably yeah. would have done, Trying wouldn't he? Yeah. Yeah. I'm surprised we haven't seen sort of people holding up number five or something like this, you know, to mark his... <laughs> oh, it's worth more than a five. Do you think so? Yeah. OK, we've got a nine then, or a seven, whatever. <laughs> but uh, it's very acrobatic, isn't it? That's for sure. Yeah. I, w I would worry if I was his manager. You know, don't, don't do that. Don't, you know, you might pull something. You might hurt yourself. Um, do any of your girls do this kind of celebrations? Are they watching this? Do you know what? There's one or two that claim really they've okay. got that in them. Okay. So, um, do you encourage that or discourage it? I'll tell you I, what. I've, I've I never really spent too much thought, but it could I all be in for a bit of a show that. this weekend. weekend. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I would I love to see this, that, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> and a word also one. about Ali Alhamidi. Um, the stat is a goal every 28 minutes or something, isn't something it, at ridiculous. the moment? Yeah, he's, he's um, with all of his. Um, who didn't turn his phone uh, off? Is that what oh dear, oh dear. That's a that's fine a round of drinks, that's I think. A red fine. card. <laughs> red card. Where was I? Ali Al Hamadi. <laughs> a word about him. Um, I mean, he's in the right place at the right time, and that's what you need to be as a striker, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. End of story. Com you know? Yeah, sort of combined yardage for his two goals of about two yards, I think, wasn't Do it? Yeah, doesn't it was matter, it. does it? Ask Guy Lineker about that. Right place, right time. Yeah. Some players have got the knack of just turning up when they need it. And he's definitely got that at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's he's he's, he's had a lack of game time and everything else. So, you know, you sort of think, well, you know, when he does come on, he makes an impact. So and that's all you can do as a substitute. You come on and you score, and you score two goals especially, but in the right place at the right time. It just shows that um, you know you've, you've you've got that, and it's nice for a manager then because he comes on and he's going. You think, well, he's going to score again the way that town play. So it's a nice it's a nice feeling, and you you know with the, with the ladies team, you you know it's you, you know your players very well. You'd love players just to be tapping goals in from a yard or two yards because that means it's a quality team goal. Would you not? Yeah, no, absolutely. Are you think. asleep then? Is there anything on there? You're right. <laughs> Just mesmerised by your <laughs> your football punditry. Um, yeah, you mean you're bored? Yeah, yeah. right. Okay. Variation, I think, Variation, is yeah. um, you know, very, a variety of goals. Obviously, makes the team quite unpredictable as well when you're trying to stop a team scoring that are in their their their, their flow. Um, and yeah, if you can create real clear cut chances that have a high probability of going in the back of the net, then you've done a good job. But when he comes on, I mean, he's all over. I mean, he's yeah. uh, he's like a little terrier, isn't he? When he comes on, it's just, you know, he's very really fresh legs. Coochie, isn't he? It's yeah. sort of putting himself about, and and yeah, I think he, he gives the defence a real hard time. What I like, he? some strikers find themselves in the eighteen yard box in space. Other strikers go in there and stand next to a defender for some reason. He's got that knack of being in the 18-yard box in two or three yards of space, which is plenty of room for him. I think he must have B.O. because no one wants to mark him, <laughs> do they? Something like that. Like, <laughs> you were one of those talking about last week? I forget. <laughs> <you>. <laughs> I'm in one of those moods tonight. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. You don't like giving biscuits away, do you? No, no, no. I don't like giving biscuits away. No, yeah. that's right. Brendan O'Callaghan, that's what you're talking Brendan about. Brendan O'Callaghan, <laughs> yes, that's right. He but in, the into the international break... Great way to go into the international break, wasn't it? We talked about that last week, and and you know to go into the break with a win like that, a couple of weeks to to regroup now for the final push. They're in a great position, aren't they? Well, they are, with the, especially with the, the you know the running. I mean, you know, we've got Southampton and Norwich um, coming up that are possibly well. You are away. You are away. Yeah. So you know, in Hull as well, Coventry. But there's those games are possibly a little bit more tricky, but. It's nothing we should fear at all. Absolutely nothing. You look at Leeds and Leicester; they're running. You know, it's um, Leeds have got uh, Hull, they've got Coventry, they've got Southampton as well. You know, these sort of think, well, you know, it, it could go anywhere. Leicester got Norwich. Yeah, yeah. Well done. Yeah, There's a bit of a token gesture. We've anyway. got five West out of the top ten, haven't we? Yeah, I mean, the, the running's a little bit similar, but it's just about the mental strength now. Yeah. And I don't know Leeds and Leicester are possibly. Especially Leicester and Leeds been up to the Premier League. They know what it takes. So mentally, they might be a little stronger. But I still fancy us. I really do. Yeah. I think really strong. And particularly at home. We're, we're dominant at home. Um, and we were dominant at Cardiff until the last five minutes of added time. But, you know, this they have the quality there. They have the goals there. And even when play, key players are out, you know, missing Burns for the, for the part of the game, missing Chaplin's. It's still banging in six goals. So it's you know this. You say team on form. This team is really buzzing at the moment. Mm. Eight games to go. Yeah, you know. Bring it on. Yeah. It's funny because this time I quickly had a, a recap in eighty eighty one season. We had fifteen games 
from this point on to the end of the season. We yeah. squeezed him in then, didn't we? Blimey. Well, shoehorned him in, I think. Yeah, well, yeah, did shoehorn him in. And we're yeah. just talking about the Coventry game being shoehorned in on the 30th, Phil, you said? 20, uh, yeah, no, 30th. Yeah, you're right. It was, it 20, was going to be on the 30th. 30th yeah. It's on the 30th now, which yeah. is between... Yeah, which was the end of season dinner night. It was, it um, was. So, so it's that's now having in the... to be moved. So it's now in the final week before the final game. So yeah. it's the penultimate match, which will be a good, <laughs> obviously a big game for and, and Coventry the as well as Town. Probably. Playoff dates have been released as well, haven't they? They have um, for the semi-finals yeah. and the final. So you know, are we looking at that? Are we looking at? Well, you're not. Are you? you're I'm still, not. No, you're I'm still, still top two yeah. all season. Top no, two. I'm, I'm not even looking at it now. Yeah. 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 No. no. Is anybody looking at it now? Are you looking at it no, now, audience? No, 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 capacity no. crowd aren't tonight. I'll, so. I'll remove that from the live speech TV news. Then. Oh, have I stolen your thunder? <laughs> there? No, it's interesting. What's the feeling around the club, Joe? Um, I mean, it is they are taking it, you know, the proverbial one game at a time, aren't they? I think so. Yeah, and and I've got to learn Kieran over the last couple of years, and I think you know you could be in and around that group and these staff. Um, and you wouldn't know whether we've just won, lost, drawn, really. Um, really consistent with our work. I think there's a great energy and enthusiasm. Um, so no nothing feels too different, really, from, from three months ago to um, 13 months ago. So, yeah, obviously there's, they're, they're really process-driven. They do a lot of really good work on the training pitch. And, um, yeah, like you said, taking it one game at a time. And uh, where they'll end up, it will be where they deserve to end up. And are you watching Kieran and his coaches? Are you picking up stuff from them? Um, since I've had a daughter, not as much. Right. Um, so I'm getting in a little bit later than I had been previously. Um, but yeah, I think you know I was I was able to benefit from seeing him and his staff work when he first joined for the first year or so, and I still see him. I still go out maybe one 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 morning a week um, and see them work and. And yeah, I really enjoy it. Take a lot from it um, because uh, it's 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 real high level stuff. I mean, the the difference him and his staff have made is just chalk and cheese to what was there before, isn't it? Incredible turnaround. Yeah, I think you know I wasn't privy to seeing too much of, of, of before, but um, yeah, I think you know just seeing Kieran work, and I think it really wet my appetite and. Yeah, I, from the from the first session I watched and and seeing him work and and deliver messages to his players and how thorough their planning was. Sorry, that's double fine. I think I'm going to get sent double off at this. Yeah, are you um, on call? No, I'm not on call. No, I just forgot. All right, I know. I tell everybody to switch it off. I have to have mine on for certain messages that come through occasionally. Sorry, Joe. Oh, I'm normally I'm normally more professional than this, but yeah, clearly not I think, tonight. Yeah, as you know, he's um. He, he's he's certainly the best I've I've come across. Um, incredibly high level, incredibly thorough. Um, but not just him. I think his team of staff, and and that's the whole staff. I think if anyone may have come across his session or or seeing that all work, um, there's a real committed group of staff from the kit men to the performance staff to um, the analysts. Um, it's a real big process and operation, um, and everyone plays their part. I think Meticulous, everyone's isn't it, Joe? It is, Meticulous, yeah, and, yeah. And I think when, when you've got such a a big department, such a strong department of knowledge that are all know their know their job inside out, um, and you repeat high level work over a significant period, then then you get success. Is it is every member of staff got a desk? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they have a desk. Yeah. Wow. I mean there's about hundred and twenty staff, so there'll be hundred and twenty <laughs> desks. When I was there as a coach back in 19 and, uh, 2019 and 2020, I had a chair. <laughs> didn't have a desk, and I used to move the chair about to try and find a desk. So I would desk chair with somebody, and I mean, Kieran. Well, not the investment, Kieran McKenna, the investment Kieran, is huge Kieran now, McKenna. isn't it, compared to them? Yeah. I mean, right across the border, right the way through. It's amazing, really, that they're you know, spending so, money all, all over the ground, aren't they? And when you have lunch, do you have shifts? Do you have, do you have certain times when you go in? And not because there must be so many staff. <laughs> They must have a huge food bill, I would think, to try and feed them. Yeah, there's a, there's a timetable of, of when, you know, depending on who's training when, depending on who's in, um, you get an email of your, your lunch allocation for the day and uh, it works quite, works quite well. You, you talk about <laughs> being meticulous, Russ. I mean, it's even down to the time that the water goes onto the pitch before kickoff. Yeah. That's all time, so it's, it's the same every week, isn't it? And, and, and you know, everything is down to, to the minutiae. And well, that's amazing to watch. Me and Terry were 
a little bit like that. We were meticulous at, uh, at Newport County. We made sure when we were painting the, the changing rooms before the season started <laughs> yep. that we got a good match of paint, didn't we? Yeah. You know, yeah. I would go and get the paint, make sure it all matched up. Tell you had to go and get the ice for the ice machine because the ice machine broke down. But, yeah. you know, we were meticulous in what we were doing. Yeah. I thought we were thorough, very thorough. <laughs> very thorough. Yeah, we had a certain time when we could paint. Right. And um, that wasn't obviously through doing training. And then we had to usher the players out afterwards because some of them would touch the paint as they do. <laughs> out so, of yeah. spite. Yeah. No but clean it was, sheets. It's a shambles. But, you know, it was. This is so professional now. You know, I had a, I had a glimpse of, of, of Kieran McKenna. We had a glimpse on the open day when they, when they, they came to the ground. You know, they've got so many staff, but at the end of the day, it's it's taken all the excuses away from the players. They have no excuses now that they can just have to get on with it. They have to perform, and they know that they've got everything. You know, we had to we had to pump the balls up and worry where the balls were and all that sort of thing, if they were hard enough or not. And then somebody forgot the cones and the bibs. The bibs weren't washed and they were dirty and all that sort of thing. That doesn't happen now. doesn't happen now. And quite rightly so as well. It's a proper football club compared to what it was uh, many years. We're not in our era, even three, four, five years ago, a proper football club. Mm. Well, it's a huge difference, isn't it? Let's talk about the women's team. How did you get involved to start with? Yeah, what's, what's, what's where did story? your coaching journey start then? Or your footballing journey? Well, um, well, where do I start? I was born in Dagenham, and uh, my mum worked for the football club at Dagenham and Redbridge. My dad had done a bit of work there as well in a coaching capacity. And um, we're re well, we're quite close friends of the management at the time, which was John Steele. Yeah. Terry Harris was his assistant. Um, and I was at college, and I used to go to the go to the club quite a lot because my mum was working, and became someone who was loosely part of the staff. I'd help out on a match day with kit, with teas, coffees, cones, footballs. Um, Travelled away to some games. That was me that time. Um, <laughs> My computer. And that was probably the first time I, I was I was w w sort of loosely working, helping out as staff when I promoted from the conference to League Two, and yeah, became fascinated really in a, a team that would, would bought in on a journey that had had success mm -hmm. in their own right. And um, John became someone I think who is obviously really well respected in the game. Was someone who got looting out of the conference into the into League Two. Um, probably a massive influence, and then got into coaching and went to take a team. I was asked to take a team, um, part of um, like a group that was connected with Leighton Orient, went to take a boys team, turned up to watch the boys team train um, in Walthamstow and the parents were just, never seen anything like it. So I was like, this is this is not for me, this. That's a great shame, we've travelled all this way. Um, the girls under 11's coach has not turned up, would you mind helping? Not really, but I like don't really like to say no to people. Um, so yeah, went and went and done it. Really enjoyed it. Can you come back next week? And was there four or five years, um, and just progressed from there really. And ended up working um, at a centre of excellence that was based in Colchester, and then was asked to take the job at Ipswich for what was at the time a little bit of a backstory to this. So. Those familiar with women's football know Lauren Hemp, brought up in Norwich. <laughs> and um, she left them to go to Bristol City. And when she went to Bristol City, I think it opened the FA's eyes a little bit to think that, why well, have we got a higher potential 16-year-old that's having to move across the country for her next step? So, obviously, she's since moved to Man City, but... The FA then decided to invest in our region to launch a new initiative. The club applied to be a sort of key stakeholder in that in that initiative and, and received uh, considerable funding to deliver what was um, an academy age group. And I was brought in to lead that. Lee O'Neill appointed me for that. And we brought in the best talent from the region, um, had an aim to just develop them, put a, a real good training program in place and so I was full-time in that capacity and obviously at the time the women's first team were 
wasn't really connected to the club. They trained at Portman Road two nights a week, really late. And we got to the point where the young players that I had invested in were ready to make that next step. So I say reluctantly, because it wasn't something I was really looking to do that early. I, I took the first team job when they needed probably someone else to steer the ship. Um, but it was probably a year or maybe a year before I would have liked to have done it. Um, but I stepped into the role, brought all the young ones up with me. Um, and it's been uphill trajectory ever since. That's five years. Five years last yeah. month, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Seven years in total at the club, I think, um, and five years with the women's first team. Yeah. And as you say, it's been a, an upward trajectory throughout that period. You've been sort of ch you've got um, you've been challenging for the for promotion to the to the women's championship. Um, came come very close in a number of seasons, haven't you? Yeah, I think. Um, Two years ago, well, we were behind schedule anyway because we were we were top of tier four when the league got null and void in March. So we were f always felt we was like a year behind because then we had to go and do another year and then we ended up getting promoted when we hardly played any games. Um, and in our first season in tier three, we won our first 11 league games, um, which was huge. And we, we became the first team to beat Southampton since they formed in a in a league fixture. Um, at their place and um, yeah took a bit of a turn at, uh, just after Christmas and, and didn't manage to um, keep the pace towards the end and missed out and then last season we didn't start great and we ended up winning our last 10 league games and finished second on goal difference mm -hmm. and then this season has been a bit of a different season because you lost a number of players in the summer and it's been more of a kind of sort of rebuild type season isn't it yeah we always knew that players were going to be ready to go and spread their wings and, and play higher and I think Paige Peak wanted to do that a couple of years ago when she wanted a, wanted to move higher and you know we sold her to Southampton at the time um, and we know that there's going to be others that are going to want to um, explore and, and try and make that next step and it became apparent last year that having not got promoted again there were some players that wanted to move on um, and yeah we I think we had 10 in total that moved on and I know I said this in, in a press conference the other day, we had 10 players moved on that, that accumulated what we think is around 550 games in senior football. And we recruited seven players that had played not even 20. Wow. So it's a huge experience yeah. shift. Um, and we've got some real good young players again coming through, but you're having to sort of go back a step or two to give them what they need to try and keep moving forwards. And, Whilst we've lost a lot of experience, um, our reputation and expectation still remains quite considerably high. You know, everyone in our division thinks we spend more money than anybody else, that we've got the best team, that we've got, you know, we were expected to do things. And sometimes these young players, a 16-year-old centre-half who's not even played a senior game, is now playing against a team that are desperate to beat us, that have got some really good experience, some, well, some good aged players. And... Um, Sometimes that's quite challenging, actually, to, to overcome some difficult games when you're expected to win and you've always come close and you spend yeah. more money and that's what people think. And, um, yeah, we have to navigate our way through that. But, um, you know, we're really focused. It's a real together group and um, we do lots of good things really well. What would promotion mean for the club and the team to the championship? It, it, it would be huge um, because as a consequence of not getting promoted last year we lost our academy license which the FA had given us five years ago to give us that and then we lost it having not got promoted because there was a reform of, of the academy structure in the country as a whole so yeah I think we would get that license back um, which means we would be able to operate um, with more staff with with um, more more funding um, and probably attract more players um, for that but um yeah, I think the opportunity to we, we we've quite enjoyed playing being the underdog, and I think some of our biggest results have been you know, we went and won away at Southampton. We were the underdog. Um, we've knocked out teams in the FA Cup over the last couple of years when we've been the underdog, and we we're probably at our best when we feel like we are the underdog. And I think having to be that that perceived best team, top team in the, in the division over a couple of years is. It's quite difficult sometimes because we bring out the best in everybody um, and sometimes we don't win games and other teams celebrate like they've just won the, the biggest game in their season and 
Um, yeah, I think we're ready to be a team that's not that that team, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, I think financially as well, I think it, it would be great because there would be considerable money. I think that we would get for, for being in the in the championship, um, and I'm sure things like attendances would would go up as well. So you this season in particular, you've had no nil nils, right? You don't do nil nils. You've had a eight nil twice victories. Five nil, seven one, four two, six one, six nil, three nil, four one, and four two, and kept seven clean sheets. So you you entertain, you score a lot of goals, and particularly, as Russell said, you you beat Chatham before six one away from home. So attacking wise, they're they're doing the business, aren't they? So you know it's it's you know okay, you're beating the teams that that are in front of you, but the obvious aim is is for promotion. But you have an emerging talent centre on Fridays. What what's all that about? Yeah, so I think the the FA um, every it feels like every two three years change the restructure of the whole pathway, and just when you think you've you've got something, you then change it again. And an ETC, an emerging talent centre, is something that has been in place now for maybe two two three years, maybe two years, um, and you you get a small pot of funding to, to operate. Um, a centre for players aged between 10 and 16. Um, you, you cater for 60 players. Um, and it's there really to bring the, the best players in the region to, to your under your umbrella for you to develop. And it's, it's the type of centre where you can still play grassroots football. So all the players that come to our emerging talent centre play for clubs locally. And then they'll come together one, once a week with us on a, on a Friday um, for, for our staff to um, to develop. Have you had any players through that? Not yet. It, it's still been quite raw. I think we've had one or two that have, have come out of that and, and trained with our, our under-21s, if you like. Um, Cole Scusi's daughter um, is, is in our Emerging Talent Centre and, uh, to no surprise, is very, very technical. He's a very good player. <laughs> um, Scoosey. Scoring yeah. goals. Technical. <laughs> so, um, yeah, she's in that, um, among many other, obviously, girls. And, um, yeah, hopefully, you know, we, we all want to try and develop that even better um, and see any players we can get out of that into our team at some point. Is it a good thing? You can say what you like because nobody from the FA is watching this tonight. Is in, is in, <laughs> is the Merging Talent yeah. Centre a good thing? Um I don't, I don't have too much of an opinion on it because, as I say, I worked, I worked at a centre of excellence at the time that had age groups of uh, 11, 13s, 15, 17 that competed. They didn't play for anyone yeah. else. It changed to 10, 12, 14, 16s. Um, the region, the centre of excellence changed to a regional talent club. The regional talent club changed to Emerging Talent Centre. They all do the same thing, really. Yeah. I think I think it's important that, where possible, we try and provide something that, that the best young talent in our region can come to. Um, you need a bit of consistency, don't you? You do. Um, you know, kids going through it need need to know what they're doing. Yeah, year and, year and you need a lot of funding as well. Yeah, and and sometimes if you only get a small pot of funding, you know, you're only going to get a small pot of work in yeah. some respects. So, yeah, I think um, you know the more funding, the, the the more workforce, the better you can do with with, with what you have available. Grassroots football doesn't seem to get much funding though. Never has done, and I had a big argument with Trevor Brooking about it one day, you know. Uh, and I think they forget where grassroots football is sometimes. Grassroots football is down here. And they need as much money as possible to be able to grow the game from the bottom. Not filter it off halfway down. Uh, but, you know, drove me mad. <laughs> well, you do need to have that kind of passion from someone like you who, who can bend people's ears, who have... Well, how many you know, kids play at the weekend where, you know, they're driving the, the, the back of the mum and dad's car on a Sunday and, you know, they go from the age of nine to 16 and never change in a change room before they play football on a Sunday or the weekend. Of course, there's no pavilions, pitches, you know, the parents have got to put the nets yeah. up, you've got to put the... In Clifton, in Bristol, well, for 30 odd years, every Wednesday and every, um, and every Saturday, the grounds would mark out 30 pitches you know, white lining them, put the goals up. Of course, you have to take the goals down afterwards or somebody would nick them. You know, the flag post and everything. Thir at least 30 pitches. I think the maximum is something like about 42. But 30-odd pitches every weekend. No funding from grassroots football whatsoever. And there's only like three or four of the lads that do it. And they've got one change room, this uh, one big pavilion. that's only got about 
eight change rooms in there. You tell me how you cope with like, you know, 60 teams at the weekend on that. Certainly needs some investment, doesn't it? Mm. Certainly needs investment. Yeah. Certainly does. Yeah. But, but but women's football's come a long way, you know, from 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 those days. Even though, you know, you're still looking for funding and everything else. I mean, have you found a bigger increase in you know a bigger interest in in, in becoming, you know, ladies becoming women becoming, fo um, footballers, professional footballers? I think so. And I, I said this in the week that I joined. Let's probably go back to your grassroots question. I, I when I joined the football club, I had a meeting with Suffolk FA, and um, we were talking about grassroots. And I was shocked at the lack of teams in this county. And where I was brought up in Dagenham, grassroots football. You know, I know I'm a, obviously a, a male, but you know, you would play in a in a in a division or a, an age group that would have an under 14s A B C D division. Under thirteens, A, B, C, D, E. Yeah. Some clubs have two, three teams in age groups in in different divisions, and I couldn't believe that there were age groups in this county that didn't have leagues, hmm. and I couldn't believe that some age groups had three, four teams in it. And it became quite apparent, I think, at the time that a lot of the best grassroots clubs in the county were playing outside the region, and that shocked me because yeah. at the time I remember thinking, "How are we ever going to get enough local talent to?" progress in, in women's football if there's not enough participation yeah. and I think our foundation that clearly have done an incredible job yep. of providing access for young players in various different levels for them to come and either play just to participate to develop at that next level and then really kick on for the strivers and um, I think this this weekend you know, is 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 far bigger than our result this weekend because I think what it can do to help improve grassroots football as an example. That's a really good thing. You know, the the young girls today have got role models now where they never had them before. They've got the pin ups on the wall of the the, the England players, their favourite players. You know, and there'll be a lot of youngsters there watching on Saturday, and it'll be you know they'll be dreaming of playing at Portman Road, won't they? Hopefully, hopefully, and. Um, I've worked in, in women's football for about 12 years, I think, and um, I've been really passionate to see it grow, but I've been, I've been really passionate to improve the product. And, you know, I've been to games. I've been in international games. I've watched World Cup games in, in France in, I can't remember what year. I remember watching thinking, oh, I, I could leave here. I'm not really enjoying this at all. And I have been passionate about developing it. So people have an appetite to come and watch it and we still have a lot of work to do I think you know we are constantly trying to div develop our players individually and obviously as a, as a team because we want we want people to come and watch us and not and not I've, I've never liked people saying to me oh aren't they good you know for girls they're, they're not bad and I hate that you know if they're I won't swear but if, if they're not good or you're not enjoying it I'm, I'll be the first person to say that's not good enough. And um, I think at the moment, this young group that many of you will watch on Saturday, average age of 20, I think will hopefully showcase something that, that will make people go, do you know what, that, that they're a good level. And we have got a lot of work to do. We're nowhere near where we want to be. But um, the product has improved, which is why I think more people have come to watch us, which I think is why there's more of an appetite for it. But we want to be even better than we are by a, a long shot. And um, we're really passionate about keep striving for that because um, we don't we don't want this attendance on a Saturday to be a one off. And then our next Portman Road fixture, whenever that might be later down the line, we don't want their numbers to decrease. We want to we want to keep growing it. Yeah. But we'll only do that if people are going to watch us and go, they're good, because if, if we're not. We're not going to get to where we want to get to. Well, I'll tell you what, Town and Town's women are lucky to have you. Joe Sheehan, everybody. Well done, Joe. Joe. Well done, Joe. Right, Joe. The moment has arrived. You watch the show, don't you? Yep. yep. So here we go. This is the Keep Me Up Me Challenge Ball, and it's sponsored by our friends at Ginger Pickle. So here we are. This is the uh, this is the ball, and uh, you've got 60 seconds over in our performance area over there 
to see how many you can do. As soon as it touches the floor, that's it. Terry's our timekeeper. Phil's got the whistle. And our capacity crowd are going to have to come forward. They're hiding at the back today to come and sleep. count. Come on, come on, capacity crowd. You're going to have to come and count. <laughs> come on. Closer than that. Closer than that. Um, and I, I saw you have a quick glance at the old leaderboard there, Joe. So 79 will get you equal with James Scowcroft at the top. 80 will get you on the, on the uh, number one slot. And anything better than 10 knocks me and Laurie Civil off the leaderboard. Um, so are Nothing you happy? Beat, are you ready? Yeah. yeah, go for it. So Terry's going to time. Phil's got the whistle. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. And time! Oh! Wow! Wow! <laughs> well done! Fantastic! Well done, buddy! We have a new leader, everybody! What was the total in the end? 102. 102. 102. Oh, 102. Smashed it, man. Smashed well it out Put another well 5,000 on the gate at Port Monroe, that one, man. <laughs> I'll be doing it at half-time on the pitch on Saturday. Yeah, half-time entertainment. <laughs> That's the first time that we've actually gone 60 seconds. Yeah, it is. Everybody yeah. else has died, Brilliant. particularly myself, well before that. So congratulations. You're smashing records. You're smashing records with the ladies' football team as well, so well done. That's brilliant. Oh, knackered. Happy with that? <laughs> Blowing a bit now. Yeah. Yeah. You'll yeah, be able to get hold your head up when you go down to Portman Road next, because uh, uh, you, you beat Chappers yeah. on yeah. there. Yeah. I'll make Jay sure Bob. he knows about that later. Yeah. 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 What was Chappers? 52. Only 52, look. <laughs> Nearly Standard double. Standing ovation when you turn up for training next time. <laughs> God, they'll all be happy. So were you a decent player then? Not really, no. <laughs> and that's me being honest. My mum would tell you different. Um, he just kept the ball to himself. Yeah, yeah, he just kept say, it up. He can't pass it, but he can keep it up. You know, I, 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 I was, I was, I was self-taught in some ways. Um, obviously, loved playing. Um, didn't really play anywhere significant, but I, th I th I've become quite. Which is where I think the coaching came from. I, I became quite obsessed with watching and observing and sort of mirroring what I would watch. And I used to watch like Xabi Alonso as an example, pass for Liverpool and think, oh my goodness, me can really play. And I'd just go over to the park really and just try and replicate it and work on stuff and became quite efficient at doing stuff. So, you know, my players would tell you that I would, you know, demo something and used to, I'm not, not as good anymore, but I used to do things that they would go, oh my God, I can't believe you just done that. Um, but I'm a bit sloppy now. I'm a bit not as <laughs> yeah. not as, we saw. Yeah, we saw not as tidy yeah, yeah, as yeah, I yeah, used yeah, to be. Yeah. But um, yeah, I'd get, that yeah. weren't a bad score. No, it's good with the old knees and everything there. That was fantastic. Well done. That's yeah, absolutely well, very, amazing. Very good, yeah. uh, don't forget if you're watching the show on YouTube to smash that like button and subscribe. You get notification when all the latest episodes are out. And if you want uh, merchandise, mugs, and shirts, go to www.lifesapitch.tv. All the details are on there. Um, we've got. A gift that's come through, uh, a Super Blues Ipswich Town FA Cup winners 1978 Ipswich 1 Arsenal nil Mirror. 
um, because lots of our stuff around here has been donated to us. Uh, And this this has come through from Lee. He says, thanks so much for your YouTube channel. Life's a Pitch TV, something I always look forward to each and every week. This mirror is in memory of my great friend Barry Ryder, who passed away recently, and he would love his team to have this as a plaque of his uh, life uh, up on your wall there. Uh, So, Lee, thank you very much indeed, and we'll get that up in memory of uh, Barry Ryder. And if you're going to the women's match on Saturday, the Food Bank uh, team are there as well collecting, and they are especially after Easter eggs. So if you're going to the match on Saturday, make sure you take some Easter eggs and uh, hand it over to the Food Bank team, and that'll end up going back to find. Uh, It's time now for Town News in Brief, sponsored by John Keeble Cars in Bramford. Phil from TWTD.co.uk with the news. And the news hat, yes. Like the issues we've talked about earlier, plenty of positives in Saturday. 6 0 thrashing a Sheffield Wednesday, but one big negative Wes Burns' hamstring injury, which he suffered in the first half. Uh, he subsequently pulled out of the Wales squad, and manager Kieran McKenna said afterwards that it didn't appear to be an insignificant injury. It doesn't look great, it's a hamstring. Uh, it, it doesn't look like a minor one. Um, we'll give a scan out of the next few days and assess it, but that's an undoubted low point of today. The club are yet to put out any further details on the injury, but it mu- he must be a concern not just for the games immediately after the international break, but for the rest of the season, which is obviously a, a big loss. Um, Town's game at Coventry, which was postponed due to the Sky Blues' progress in the FA Cup semi-final, uh, has been given a new date. The Blues will now travel to the Coventry Building Society Arena. That's very snaffly named, isn't it? Uh, on Tuesday the 30th of April, the match will now be the penultimate game of the season, with the campaign ending the following Saturday when Huddersfield visit Portman Road. So a big game. Uh, a lot of people drawing parallels with the ba- Barnsley game last year, which was um, delayed until kind of right to the end of the season. Um, yes, it's very likely to have something riding on it for both teams. The town vying for automatic promotion and the Sky Blues targeting the playoffs. Um, playoffs, which we've mentioned earlier, they have given the dates. The first leg of the tie between the teams finishing sixth and third will take place on Sunday the 12th of May, with the second leg hosted by the third place side on Thursday the 16th of May. The fourth, the fifth v fourth first leg will be on Monday the 13th of May, with the fourth place hosting the second leg on Friday the 17th of May, and the final on Sunday the 26th of May. But we won't need that, will we? No, automatic. No, we won't. Uh, Cameron Burgess helped Australia to a 2-0 World Cup qualification victory over Lebanon earlier today, winning his seventh cap. Uh, he, he played a role in the second goal, a header from a corner falling to Hearts defender Kai Rowles, who um, found the net. Nathan Broadhead and Kiefer Moore are both on the bench for Wales this evening uh, in their playoff against Finland at the Cardiff City Stadium. And Jeremy Sarmiento and Ecuador play Guatemala in a friendly at the Red Bull Arena in New Jersey in the early hours. Good luck to everyone, especially Wales. I think uh, Wales getting to the to the uh, finals in the summer will be uh, terrific, I think, for, for town. And finally, uh, voting is underway in the Men's Player of the Year Award via the Supporters Club website. You can find a link on TWTD. Uh, the field looks as open as any year. I think I kind of think anyone's really emerged as a favourite in that, I don't think. Anyone? I would go for our skipper Sam Morsey or... Or Vaslav Haladki, I think. Yeah, Vaslav. I think those would be my two choices. I don't know what do you think, Russ? What would your two be? Or one? It's a very good question. It's been a real good team effort, yeah. hasn't it, this season? Yeah. I think more than any other. Um, I would say don't don't overlook the goalkeeper. Yeah, yeah. Because he's come in this year after not getting a game last year in the league, really, just uh, cup games. I think he played. Yeah, and he played twenty minutes in the league at the end and of the season. Yeah. yeah, and he's kept Christian Walton out on merit this season and been um, a key key player in the way that they play. Yeah, you know, and he stuck at it. And yes, he's made the odd cock up here and there, but he's had the backing of the manager and the player himself has had the has had the character to carry on doing what his manager wants him to do. So I think he's had a very good season. Butch? Uh, I'm going for a defender, Cameron Burgess. So Mm. I think that he has big question marks, and I was putting forward those uh, questions as well as to uh, a doubt about his ability to perform in the championship, but he's just took it in his stride. He's a natural. And he's played international football as well. He played at Wembley against England and played very, very well. So I think his progress has been rapid, it's been strong, it's been steady. I think he's um, secured that defence. OK, we've conceded a few goals, but you can't actually point many goals or hardly any goals at, at him. Um, 
and he's popped up with the occasional goal. But he's very just, reliable, isn't he? Yeah, very reliable. Consistent. And his, his diagonal from left to right is, you know, that's tremendous to Burns out there. A bit like yours used to be. Yeah, but oh, I used to miss him a few times, and I put it on the top of the stand. That's what I used to do generally. <laughs> Made a career out of it. But no, he, he, he's. I think he's impressed me. Yeah. I think he's. Who would you go for, Phil? I think Plaid King. I think it's, yeah. I was thinking about it earlier, but Morsi is another good shout. I think um, and Burgess again. Yeah, it's, it is very open. I think you know, look at people like Wes Burns have had great seasons as well. Connor Chaplin's had a good season again. Um, but the obvious, the obvious Hurst, ones are the uh, goal scorers, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, Hurst. I say with Hurst, on. probably first half of the season was very, very good. Keith moore has been very, very good last month. You've known so. just about everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah this yeah, is yeah, this right, is this is what on. we kind of say about the whole <laughs> season as a, as a season as a whole. Longer, you can look at his season being terrific. Everyone's had a. Had a good season, really. Um, and th there's also a vote for a new award, Portman Road Moments. That's also underway, uh, which is a chance for fans to select an iconic moment from home games this West season. West Burns goal. Oh, do you know, that's exactly what I was going to come to. Do you think, Joe? Oh, I'm trying to think. What I think I enjoyed the first goal on Saturday. Yeah. I think it was a, it was a terrific goal. Um, but yeah, Wesley's goal was, was certainly up there. Special, mm. wasn't it? Mm. Yeah. Chap I won't ask you about player because you've got a face all this week to choose one. So mm. There's a Chaplin's goal as well, and I think and they kind of made that sort of move yeah. when, when it was cut back by uh, Davis. I can't feel it was against Hull. And uh, yeah. that, that I think moment was. of the year at Portman Road is when I announced the wrong team substitution. <laughs> as well as waiting for that. <laughs> well, what about wrong goal scorer as well? Oh, yeah. That, well, I was fed that. That was not my fault, that one. Oh, yeah. Well, got it. What not? <laughs> no, okay, okay. That well, I called, I, I called Amari Hutchins for the last goal on Saturday, and it was actually yeah. Ali, and I did do the correction yeah. on the thing. Yeah. But it's in, in fairness, it was the other end of the field, and it's quite difficult to see where we are. They have uh, different goal celebrations, though, Mark, those two players. Yeah, well, I looked on the monitor, and someone was rubbing Amari's head as well, so I thought it must have been him that scored. No, it's more, we, we just got it wrong. And we do sometimes, we get, yeah, you, you no, call it wrong, but we corrected it afterwards. Thanks for reminding me of that, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll try and do better no, no, next it was, week. It was, it was, yeah, it was one of those where it sort of came across, and if you didn't see it from right angle, it, it looked as if it went straight in. I think. It, we, we have yeah. spotters. But even they get it wrong sometimes. But we got it right in the end. Yeah. So. Um, and, and, and voting for the Women's Player of the Year. Uh, that takes place in the marquee in the fan zone before Saturday's game against Chatham Town. We we'll certainly wouldn't ask Joe to name his, his Player of the Year for that. <laughs> Not head of the game, anyway. Um, uh, and the awards will be present, presented on Saturday, April 13th. Uh, the Academy and Women's Player of the Year's uh, awards will be handed out before the match, along with the Irene Davy Award, uh, which is dedicated to the uh, in, in memory of uh, Supporters Club's former patron who died relatively recently, uh, and that will be presented by a member of Irene's family. Uh, and then the Men's Player of the Year and the Portman Road Moments will be made at full time. Brilliant. That's very much. That's, that's the, the news. news. That's the news this week. Um, and he's asked for extra time this week because there is so much historical news on this day. Uh, Russ is going to bring us uh, this week's uh, news of what's happened to ITFC in the past, brought to you in association with Fred Olsen Logistics. <laughs> Well, Ipswich Town on this date, history, facts and figures from every day of the year, from Dan Botton. And we've actually got a page full, because for some reason, when uh, the 21st of March, uh, lots of things seem to be happening. And we're going back to start in uh, March 1953, which reminds me, I've got to say uh, uh, a good look to uh, Graham Keeble from John Keeble Cars, who's just had a new knee, or half a knee. And it's quite amusing because I asked him how the food was uh, in the hospital because he does like his food. <laughs> and he said, it's very good, actually, uh, and he's going to book himself in for another six days. <laughs> 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 That's typical of Graham. If you know Graham, his humour's... Um, very good. It matches his appetite. Yes, very, <laughs> very large. Right, Wednesday the 21st of March, 1953, Millwall won 6-1-2, inflict a record home defeat, which would stand for 49 years. Blimey. A paltry crowd of 9,373 saw Tommy Parker score the only goal for the town. Right, moving on, Saturday the 21st of March, 1964, a fortnight after being crushed 6-0 at Liverpool, Jackie Milburn's men went down 9-1 at Stoke in Division 1. Blimey. Dennis Violet, who survived the Munich air disaster, scored a hat-trick. Moving on. Saturday, the 21st of March, 1970, Trevor Wymark. Blimey. 
scored the first of his 104 Blues goals in a 2-0 victory at Portman Road over Sunderland. I didn't realise Chavez started that early. Why Mark uh, scored four goals in a match three times for town, also won an England cap against Luxembourg and joined Vancouver Whitecaps after 335 games for town. Moving on again. Wednesday the 21st of March 1979. Even I played in this game. A mammoth crowd of 100,000 at the New Camp. The joint biggest crowd Ipswich have played before. That game saw Barcelona win 1-0 and go through to the European Cup Winners' Cup fourth round. Dodgy refereeing decision. It I think it was a penalty. Dodgy referee, very yeah. dodgy. <laughs> Cheating. <laughs> Moving Still on, rankled. Saturday the 21st of March, this time 1981. Towns 2-1 defeat at Manchester United was their first defeat in 20 games. Terry Butcher grabbed Ipswich's goal in front of 46,685 fans. No somersault. No, no somersault. somersault. <laughs> but we lost. It was a header at the Stretford end as well. Yeah, who yeah. scored for them? Uh, I can't remember. I was still celebrating my goal. It was a rarity. <laughs> it was a very rare achievement. Yeah. yeah. What is it like to score at somewhere like Old Trafford? It's quiet. <laughs> Pretty quiet. Just, just shake hands and walk back to the centre circle is what yeah. you used to do. Yeah. Yeah. No. no fist pump or anything, was there? Fist pumps? No, there's no fist pumps. <laughs> no they weren't no invented then, were they? No, no. Um, shake your hand. Well done. Just move back. <laughs> you go. Jolly good goal. And some of the, some of the defenders never even came up and all that. Congratulated you. They were oh, like it's that. Too far. Good goal. <laughs> too far to go. Why would right, you walk all the way up like, there? Why would you do that? You see now, you see goals scored, and you see the team spend a little bit of time celebrating, but also oh, like, Chappers is the best at it. Isn't resetting it? a little bit. Is that something that would take place? Or is that quite something new, do you think? Is that is that something you thought of? I think it's something new. We, we just used to get back and get on with the game. I know Connor Chaplin is the oh. slowest to come back the into last his man. own He's half. Always. always, and the referee always has to accompany him and try and move him a little He's bit quicker. He's always the last one to walk back. He's always He's the last one. I mean, it's five minutes after the goal has scored and he's still not back in Ipswich's half. It's oh. brilliant. So that's gamesmanship? Oh, it is a bit. It is, yeah. But he gets away with it. You know, it's not so it might get at one or two people's nose, but but it's, it's no well, problem. Joe is it's, like, it's, it's sort of setting the, the getting the mindset back, isn't it? It's sort of that kind of moment of elation about after scoring. It's hard to kind of immediately kind of switch back on again. So if you give that little bit extra time, then that makes it easier. I also it? think similar to us, and I'm sure this might take place with Kieran and his staff, is that sometimes it's a good opportunity as well to get some information on. Mm. So you might see them go and celebrate. If you probably pay attention, you might see someone like Cameron Burgess or Leaf, if it's happened on the other side, quickly go to the dugout, bit of information. It might be a, an opportunity for you to get something on or address something if you need to as well from the staff yeah, perspective. I thought they were running on to the dugout and saying who scored. <laughs> we couldn't see who scored. Who scored? I was I was in charge. You can't of... rely on the PA guy, can you? No, you can't rely on him. No, he's useless. That guy, or, or by the, the way. Spotter. The spotter. 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 I was in charge of a team in, in Sydney uh, many many years ago, and um, Sydney they, we scored, which was a rarity. Again, we scored, and they all came back to the towards the dugout and sort of celebrated. They were they were on the pitch, and in the you know our our own half. So everybody's congratulating each other. And there was one defender that was back that didn't come up and join everybody. The, the only one, and the goalkeeper, of course. And so the other team got the ball and kicked off. <laughs> and nine of the players are standing right by the dugout on the pitch. And I've, I've gone ballistic on the sidelines. But, the, but then the referee just said, well, you know, you're all back in your own half. They were ready to kick off. So they kicked off. And the one defender won the ball and kicked it out of play. <laughs> <laughs> it was miraculous. He, he got a wage riser next week, I'll tell you. It was, I, I went mad at the referee, but the referee says, well, you're all back in your own half. So they're the if you, you've, you, you might have seen this, but if the whole team go off the pitch and celebrate and the goalkeeper's in the goal on his own, they can kick off. So if you've, I've seen it a couple of times where we will score, Connor Chaplin celebrates an all-stand and Cameron Burgess will stay on the pitch. I think I've seen Cameron do it quite a lot, where everybody is off the pitch. He will stay on the pitch, so they can't kick off because he's still in their half. 
Got you. So if ten outfield players all went into the north stand yeah. and left the goalie in the half on his own, they could kick off and go and score. Because hmm. technically, no one's in the opposing half. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll, you'll always see one player at least, and usually it's Cameron Burgess yeah. who will, or will just wait on the pitch so they go and celebrate. Fascinating insight, isn't it? Mm. Um, just before we go, uh, the Man VFAT results for this week. Uh, another successful session on the fan zone pitch. Last Friday saw the guys pass through the 200 kilogram barrier after just nine weeks of our 14 week current season. Congratulations to town fan Ashley Page, who has lost nearly 30% of his body weight and qualified for our amazing losers match at the Den, which will be managed by two ex-England players, with hopefully one of them being someone we know very well, Terry Butcher. Uh, this week's results, far from Athletic 16, Pork Vale 10, LA Galaxy Bar 16, Man Titty 7, oh. Seattle Quarter Pounders 7, to lose a few pounds 13, Argentina 7, Dinamo Kebab 7. Uh, P.S. Did you ever consider bringing in Edward Ebenezer Jeremiah Brown into the show on Life's a Pitch or maybe Brian in Melton coming onto the show? No, we haven't either of those. Thank you very much. Uh, that's from Man V Fat Mark. Uh, Joe, look, it's been great to have you on the show today. It really has. And good luck to you and the women on, on Saturday. It's going to be a really special day, isn't it? And, and hopefully a sign of things to come. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, and uh, thanks for having me on. And you know, I think you know we, and certainly myself and, and the players, are, f are fully aware of not just how big of opportunity this is for us and impact we can have on our region, but even how historic the venue is. And I think I see a podcast yesterday with a couple of our players on, and you know, our players really do understand how big of a deal it is to play somewhere like this, and. I was randomly Googling a couple of things Jesse and, and come across a, a photo of Mick Mill shaking Johan Cruyff's hand in the centre circle and you know, I think I think everybody can be assured that we, we fully realise how big it is for us to play somewhere like this. Um and I think as we've said, the opportunity for us to make an impact which I think England's lionesses have done. Mm in terms of what they've done and inspired so many across the nation. But I think this is different because we've got local girls that will be watching us potentially for the first time that live a few miles, few few minutes around the corner that are going to watch players play in front of what we'll hope be close to about 10,000. Um, and, and one day could aspire to do that themselves. And, you know, I think our CEO speaks so well about mm. our community and the impact that we have um, on our county in particular and um, you know women and girls are a huge part of that and um, um, we're so excited to grow that and inspire and, and um, our, our players in particular won't pass on the opportunity of being role models for so many young girls over many years. Do you know what? I've been to some matches at Portman Road where there have been fewer than the amount of people that are going to be on there on Saturday watching the game. I've been when it was like seven, 8,000, I'm sure some of you have in the past, for some of the men's games. So they've eclipsed some of the, the, the crowd totals that we've had there in the past. So it's a real testament to, to what's happening at the club. It really is. So good luck. Joe Sheen, everybody. Right, well done, Joe. Thanks, well done to the Tractor Girls on Saturday. Uh, we're out of time for this week. There's no show next week. We're having an international break next week, but we will be back because the next show will be ahead of the Norwich game. Mm. And just before the Norwich game... Mm. Golf. Golf. Ipswich Town Legends, or Team Osman, is taking on the Norwich City Legends, mm. led by uh, Brian Gunn, the goalkeeper. <laughs> Hopefully he's wearing that speckly college <laughs> Let's shirt. Let's hope the so, one yeah. That missed the ball with you, you know. We all Fantastic. remember that goal. And that's taking place at Purdis Heath Golf Club on the 4th. So that's the Thursday before the the big game on the on the 6th. Okay. So good luck with that. And all that is trying to raise money for Team Stewart, Marcus Stewart and uh, the Derby Rimmer Foundation. So, you know, if people can just look online and uh, donate a few pounds towards that it would be much appreciated fantastic so, great course well done Russ uh, that's it for this week as I say no show next week uh, big thank you to our main sponsor DPS Tech also supported by All About Hearing marketing company Ginger Pickle Forward Floors Come Hither Design the Hudson Group Sound 4 Pro Audio 
Fred Olsen Logistics, John Keeble Cars in Bramford, the Dove in St. Helen Street in Ipswich, and also Ashford Wright and DPS Tech sponsor, The Sofa. Uh, thanks very much for joining us this week. Thank you, Capacity Crowd. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, team. Right. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Up the town, everybody. Up the town. Up the town. Blue Army. Blue Army. Blue Army. Blue Army. Blue Army. Blue Army.